Hello. I am working on getting the video to work. So let's see if I can get this. There we go. Hello, everybody. How are you doing tonight? I hope you are well. Um, it is October 9th, 2014. It is 8 o'clock Central Time. I am here with you uh, as we're going to go over Interactive Notebook Basics. Uh, tonight's webinar is going to cover the basics of interactive notebooks and how to maintain drive throughout the year. Recently, many of you filled out my survey that I had for you, and you gave me m such great feedback on your struggles, things that were testing you, and things that you needed help with to stay strong throughout the school year. So tonight, I'm going to go over some of the ba basics, but I'm going to also hopefully answer some of your questions for from those struggles that you are having. So go ahead and check in if you are viewing live tonight. Um, question and answer should be open for you to put in your comments. So make sure that you have downloaded the handout for tonight. Uh, it not only will give you an outline for what we're going to cover, but it will also give you uh, all, all this that I'm going to go over, as well as a certificate for attendance if you can turn that in in your school district. So, a little bit about me. My name is Jennifer Smith Sloan, and I am Formula Fun Incorporated. I have been in the education field since 2003, and I have been using interactive notebooks since 2010. I really enjoy using interactive notebooks as well as love seeing the changes that my students get uh, over the course of the year with their interactive notebooks. So I am going to start by uh, trying to screen share with you. And I am going to screen share the slideshow so that we can kind of go through it together and we can talk about the few things. I'm going to pop back and forth with video, uh, a live video with you as well. So make sure you're following along. So this is the handout and what it looks like that you should have received, uh, been able to download. Uh, the link is provided on the events page as well as an email that you received. This is basically the title of tonight, and that is our objective. The next thing, this is our uh, outline for tonight. Giving you my intro, we're going to hit uh, four main points. Uh, planning for interactive notebooks, materials to use with your interactive notebooks, the output portion of an interactive notebook, and how students can make them their own and use them in the classroom. From the information that I got from all the surveys that were submitted, those were the key areas that people were really, really struggling with and really wanting more information. So the first uh, one that I'm going to show you is we're going to talk about planning. Uh, get went to the wrong page. Hold on. Sorry about that. There we go. Trying to make sure I'm showing you the right pitch. There we go. And planning is important not only as a teacher, but also from the student's benefit. When we take time to plan ahead of time, sitting down with our curriculum guide, sitting down with a planning sheet, sitting down with the school calendar, and really truly planning our lessons and our units ahead of time, not only will our lessons go smoother, but our students' understanding will increase, as well as their retention. They will see that we are prepared, and they will know that they will start to emulate that themselves. They will start to say, oh my goodness, you know, I could see this teacher put a lot of time and a lot of effort to making sure this lesson was ready for us. And when I take time and I put effort into something, I can be prepared for something as well. And we're trying to show that to our, you know, 
children of today. We want them to be good citizens and we want them to be prepared for the world and showing them how to plan is part of that. Now, this does take a lot of time on the teacher's part. I will tell you, this is probably where I spent the bulk of my time uh, in the classroom when I was using interactive notebooks, was sitting down, planning out my units. I would gather my uh, curriculum guide, which really was just the set of standards, and it told me what order to teach them in. That was it. And I had that, and I had the school calendar, so I could mark off days that I knew we, we weren't um, able to do a full lesson, or we were out of school, or this, that, or whatnot. And then I sat down with this planning sheet that I created that you can grab free in my interactive notebook starter pack. Now, with this, it helped me organize where my students were going throughout the year. And I noticed that when I started doing this, my notebooks made more logical sense. And they were able to flow from one lesson to another instead of feeling like they were hodgepodge all over the place. When you as a teacher take time to do that, it's going to make it to where your notebooks are that much more beneficial for your students as well because they flow in order that the students can use them correctly and use them to benefit them and their learning. Now, I'm going to stop sharing for a moment because I'm going to show you a notebook that when I was in the classroom, I was working on unit four for probability, and I always gave my students a uh, cute little number for their unit, and that's where their vocabulary would go. And this is actually where I left on uh, medical leave that year. So we did some lessons together, and what you can't see under these lessons is where I actually physically planned everything out. But you can see on the next pages, it was supposed to be for experimental probability. I planned it out step by step what we were going to cover because I knew I was going to put a flippable or some notes on top of that so it didn't matter. Now, I have also seen teachers plan it out in a completely separate notebook, like just like this, and then they create it to where they can put it in their classroom notebook. But you can see I was ahead on everything. I tried to stay always a unit ahead of my students. Now, there were times that it didn't happen, and that was okay. But as long as I was staying ahead of my students, I wasn't coming into class, um, what am I supposed to cover today, or what topic's next, or, oh, let's just pick a topic. I needed to know where things were going. And that, from what I'm seeing from most of everybody's struggles, is plan, plan, and plan some more. Sometimes I'm just not sure what to do. You just need to sit down, look at your standards, look at your order that you need to be teaching them in if you are given one. If you don't have one, make one up. Sit down and do that. And when you take that time, yes, it's time out of your uh, outside of the classroom life, but it will make your life so much easier from there on out. So creating a plan for the year is where you need to set your goals from day one. You need to do that first thing. Okay, let me see if we have any questions coming in. Questions, questions, questions. Making sure on all the areas. I'm so happy that there are so many of you in the room tonight. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that I answer all questions as we go as well. Okay, the next part about planning for interactive notebooks, it is important that you set up routines. And let me show you some pictures for some routines that I had set up in my classroom. I set up routines from day one in my classroom. And there we go. My students, when they walked into my classroom, they we had a table just like this right here in the center. And on that table, they would pick up their materials for the day. You can see this day they had five different things they needed to pick up. Now, this was, this was early on in the school year because they're gluing in their grading rubric. 
We've got two components of a lesson. They've got practice problems that they're doing to turn in for a quick daily grade. And then they've got part of their homework assignment right here. This was also my table where my turn in baskets were for the different grade, uh, different periods. You can see they're not even labeled yet in this picture. Um, I also had my exit slip tub. This was like my main hub by the entrance door of my classroom. My students knew that was an important, important table. You did not walk into the classroom without passing by that table because that's where you're going to get everything that you needed for the day. Now, also in my classroom, I had these three crates in the back of my room. I had one that was for class handouts. This crate was labeled with hanging file folders 1 through 31. So if on October 9th we did a lesson and I had extras left over from that lesson, I would go put them in the folder labeled with the number 9. So that way if a student knew they were absent on October 9th, they could go to the file, the crate, look into that folder, grab out the materials for that day, and they could have the materials they needed. Now granted, I taught middle school. And I could hold my kids to this responsibility for making sure they have their assignments. Upper elementary, you probably could. But even as a teacher with lower elementary students, this would be a good place for you. That way you have everything all together and you're not worried about, oh, where is that piece of paper? And where's that piece of paper? Oh, I need to go make another copy of that because we ran out because Johnny and Taylor had to redo it. And that was all the copies I had. We know how life happens. This way you have all your class hand, extra handouts in one location. The other two crates were for graded papers. I gave every single student, all 150 of my kiddos, a folder with their name on it. And that's where I put their graded papers. It saved me time in class from having to pass them back out. And believe you me, I always had early finishers who wanted to file graded papers. So it was a benefit for me as well as a benefit for them. So if you don't have a place in your classroom that you can uh, put the necessary supplies for the beginning of your class period, or if you teach a lower uh, grade level or even a class where you, teach, you don't switch classes, make sure you set up routines. Make sure that your students know the routines in your classroom every day. And being a structure sergeant is what I called myself. But being that structure sergeant is what's going to help you get through your class period. For me, we had a 42-minute class period. And that 42 minutes went by fast. I got rid of bell ringers because for me, my students were preparing their notebooks as part of their bell ringer. That was what they were doing. Preparing their notebooks means that they were cutting down their materials that needed to be glued in. They were titling the top of their page. They were making sure it had the page number on it. They were updating their table of contents and they were ready for class. They did that in the first three minutes of class. Now, in the beginning of the school year, we weren't at the first three minutes of class, but I just had to be diligent and I had to say, okay, time's up. If you didn't finish, you need to finish it later on your own time. And we moved right along. If you wait for the slowest person in your classroom to be finished, you are always going to be struggling to finish your lessons every day. Or you're always going to be frustrated because you're not getting everything in you need to get done. Believe you me, I've been there. I did this for five years in the classroom before I left the classroom. And I still am helping teachers every single day get their classrooms ready and organized to be able to use interactive notebooks. So also part of this, routine area, a lot of people were saying that they were trying to find a balance between what they are required to do by the district and what they want to do with the notebooks. So I kind of would fit this into the routine area. Knowing that many districts require you to do certain things. They want you to do vocabulary in a certain way or they want you to do vocabulary period or they want you to cover these certain sections or they want you to put homework in it. They don't want you to put homework in it or some of your districts may say, we just want you to do it, or, but we don't have anything to tell you about it. That's where you really, really need to, again, plan it out. Determine what you have to hit in every single lesson. Remember, you don't have to put material in your interactive notebook every single day of the week. 
I would say from the get-go, start with just two or three days a week. Maybe even one, if that's all you can handle. That's okay. As long as your students on those other days are using their interactive notebook to be effective, then they are using that resource that they are building and eventually they're going to start taking ownership and say, and they're going to tell you, when are we going to put more stuff in our, in our notebooks? They want to put more in it. I hear from teachers all the time saying that to me, that they, their kids are asking them when they're going to put the next stuff in their notebooks. So not seeing any questions, which is perfectly fine. I know that a lot of you have submitted your questions to me, which is great. Um, the next part that I want to hit is about materials. I have teachers asking me all the time, how do you manage your materials? How do I make sure that we have the materials that we need every day? So, in my classroom, I had it set up in two ways. One was every table was in a set of four. At those tables, they each had four table jobs. There was the table leader, there was the scribe, there was the materials manager, and there was the cleanup crew. Those four jobs helped me maintain order in my class beyond just the order that I had as a teacher. The table leader was in charge of the table and making sure everything was going the way that it was supposed to go. The scribe was in charge of writing anything that needed to be written down for group work or uh, if they were doing a game or whatnot. They were in charge of that. The materials manager was in charge of that tub right there you see on the desk. They were also in charge of if I forgot to pass something out, they got to come up, grab that necessary item and get it for their class. This is when normally I would use, if I use manipulatives as part of our lesson, I didn't want to have them already on the tables because I knew kids would fidget with them. So it was, for me, it was easier to have a materials manager come up and get the necessary materials for that activity for the class. Now the last person was the cleanup crew. You can see this little tub right here. I call it my tidy trash tub. That tidy trash tub, I'm going to zoom in for you. I simply got it from Dollar Tree and at the end of every class period, the cleanup crew was in charge of dumping that tidy trash tub into the trash. That's where all their trash from their interactive notebook items went. That way I didn't have 30 students getting up out of their seat to go throw away stuff. Again, it maintained order in my classroom. Now. Materials that I had um, for the materials manager to get, such as their glue ran out, or their red marker dried up, or they ran out of tape, or this, that, or whatnot. You can see over here on this bookshelf, I have similar tubs, and they were all labeled. Like this one was highlighters, and I see one with markers, and all the various things that we needed in class. The materials manager didn't even come to me as a teacher. They knew where the materials were located. It was simply, if you have an, something that you need because it's run out or it's missing or this set or whatnot, take care of it, get it yourself, come back to your desk, get back to work. It made life so much easier on me as a teacher to give that responsibility to my students. Even though I am so OCD, it's not even funny, and you can see it's very orderly back there on my bookshelf, except for the blue sticks because I had a little bit of a surplus. Um, I needed my students to see that structure was important. And by them seeing that, they could see that it, the materials meant a lot to me as a teacher. And having those materials was a privilege. Now, most of the materials in my classroom were either provided by me, uh, leftovers from the year before, or some were from the students of that year. Now, I will tell you, I had very few materials in my classroom provided by my students because my school did collection during one class period where you collected all of the 
quote unquote community type supplies for middle school, the crayons, the markers, this, that, and whatnot. Well, during that class period, I only had eight students. Uh, it was a resource math class. So I didn't get many community supplies to start with. So it was a lot of begging for me. And as a teacher, I'm not ashamed to beg. It happens. And I would tell my students, you know, I mean, if you can bring it, uh, I told them for every two glue sticks they brought in, they got a sticker. For my class, stickers really worked as incentives. And once they got 25 stickers, they got a free homework pass. Um, that was my way of doing things in my class. And that was, it worked well. Now, we did end up using a lot of liquid glue as well because some of my students learned that it, you know, it works a lot better, especially with um, our lovely Texas humidity. Uh, glue sticks tend to stop being sticky over time and things will fall out of the notebooks because they've lost their stickiness. So a lot of us started using uh, liquid glue over time. Now, as a teacher, if you have not heard of donorschoose.org, I suggest you take some time and jump on over there. Donorschoose.org is a place where you can set up a grant to be funded not only by companies and corporations and all of this, but also just by individuals. And you can set it up for anything in your classroom. I see a ton on there every time I'm on there searching for new uh, grants to help out with. I see a ton on there that are for materials for interactive notebooks. I recently um, just helped two teachers get theirs funded and I'm so happy that they are able to use interactive notebooks in their classrooms because of the help that I've done for them. I've donated to both of them. I will continue to spotlight a classroom every month or until it's funded. That month, uh, we were on our second project this month because uh, the first one got funded within the first couple of days. So take some time and do that. Otherwise, when stores are having sales, and if you have the ability, you know, when Office Depot, Office Max, Staples, Target, whatever, whenever they're having a sale, especially during the back to school time rush, of course, Grab what you can because you know that there's going to be some material that some child's not going to have. Or don't be afraid to ask the manager, I know your limit is three. I'm a teacher in a, at such and such school. Is there any way you can lift that limit for me? The worst they can say is no. I've had many, many managers say, sure, I'll lift it to 30 for you. Um, so don't be afraid to ask. And also Staples has a 110% price match guarantee, use that price match guarantee. If Office Depot has something on sale, but you have a Staples closer or a Staples the same distance near, go to Staples, show them the Office Depot ad. They'll not only match it, but they give you an extra 10% off. So save a few extra pennies that way. Okay, the next section that's a big, big question by teachers is the output section. Now, output is simply what the students are getting out of your lesson. You're putting information in, you're giving them the input, they're pulling information out from what they have processed from the lesson that day. Okay, so output can be in many different forms. Some of those forms are from a journal, completing a chart and reflecting, doing a sort, doing example problems from on the board or in a book, and then writing a summary. There are so many different types of output. Output is all about students synthesizing what they have learned and putting it out there in the world, putting it down on paper so that they can communicate what they have learned. It's basically, it's a show me what you know in some different way. Think about it. They can use mind maps. They can use thinking maps. They can create sorts. They can create word problems. They can 
do just about anything that can show what they know. And the best thing about this is you can even give kids free choice on what they do. Or say you put three or four choices up on the board that they could do for their output and they choose which one works best for them. When I let my students choose or when I let my students create their own answer, whether it be a journal or a show me what you know or create your word problem, that's when I really got a lot of great information from my students. And I, they wanted to come show me. They would bring their notebooks up to me and they would come show me and look, 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 look what I know and show me what I know. But it's also a great data tool. That output is showing you where your students are on every single standard that you're working on. So if you have a data conference or you have an IEP meeting or you have a parent conference or even a principal meeting about a student, you have data in their notebook to back you up on how they're doing in their standards. So again, that notebook is not only great for student use, it's also great for teacher use when you need that data backup and you're not having to worry about collecting samples for student input on where they are in every single standard. Because I know, I've been there. And I've had to do that as well. So let me go ahead and uh, address some of the questions that I had about this. I had people, I had a teacher ask, you know, I teach special ed students with behavior issues. So there tends to be a lot of students who are missing instruction either because of an absence or being out of the room due to behaviors. As much as I feel it is a student's responsibility to follow through with what they have learned, it is really hard due to the fact that they are missing the instruction. How can I compile output for the students when they have missed the instruction to begin with? Right here is a great example. Say a student's absent and they didn't get their lesson from you. Or say a student has had to be called out for this, that, or whatnot. It happens. Find a video online YouTube is great, Khan Academy is great, LearnZillion is great. There are many, many resources out there that you can find a video that teaches the same lesson you taught. Students can get the same information to put in on their input side and they can put together their notes, but then they can synthesize what they learned and put it together as an output. So use that technology resource as a way to help you keep your students caught up in and outside of the classroom. Also, uh, let me see, I lost my place. Okay, moving on. So with the journals or with the output section, it's important to always follow up. Don't just let your students reflect and you as a teacher not follow through. You as a teacher need to go through and spot check or um, do a quick check uh, occasionally so that students know that you are looking at it and that it's important to you just as it is important to them. When they see that it is important to you, they're going to raise their standards as well and they're going to come meet you where your standards have been set. So if you've given students a journal and it's an open journal one day and they just get to talk about what they've learned, you know, very open, I would schedule that as one of your quick checks. And when I say a quick check, uh, every two to three week period, I would do four to five quick checks for my kids. And I would say, okay, turn to page 39. I want to see your I can statement. If the I can statement was written on there for their objective for the day, they got a check mark. If it wasn't written, they didn't get that check mark. Over the course of time, determining whether I did four or five, um, it was a daily grade that I did for 100. So if they had four out of four, they got 100. If they had three out of four, it was a 75 for that daily grade. And so on. That kept my students accountable for keeping up with their notebook. You as a teacher need to enforce that. And when you as a teacher, and I've been there. If you slip up and you just like, oh, it's okay, you know, just get caught up when you can, they're going to start taking that as the word every day. 
And so you as a teacher need to instill the structure in your classroom and keep it going. A lot of people are asking me about planned curriculum as well. And I know that uh, I've been working really hard on a new website called interactivitiesforall.com. On this website, it's going to focus on tips, tricks, and strategies for you to use in your classroom with interactivities. Interactivities meaning activities that are interactive, whether they be interactive notebooks or interactive learning games or interactive uh, technology, all these different types of things is going to be focused on on this uh, new site. Well, on this site, there is also an FAQ. This FAQ is a compilation of my most asked questions. So if you think you have a question for me that probably has been answered before, this is a great place to go check. So it's simply interactivities for the number four, all.com. And you can click on the little FAQ up at the top. If you're already on that page because you're viewing this webinar there, um, Make sure you right click and open in a new window so that way you don't lose the webinar. So, moving along, I have teachers ask also, how do I get my students to make their notebook their own? Well, just like anything else, Color helps us make it our own. This is also part of what I was going to talk about while I was talking about materials. So let me go ahead and talk about it now. This is my basket. So as a teacher, I have all of my supplies in one location. This right here helps to model to my students that it's important to keep all of our supplies together in one location so they can be easily found. So this is just like my little version of their shoe box that they have on their table. It has my markers, my fat ones, and my thin ones, and my flares. You're hearing my dog. It has highlighters. This one's also a pen as well. Pencils, because you never know when you're going to need more than one. Sorry, she's wanting attention, so I'm petting her. It has washi tape. I have colors or crayons, as some people say. I have a Sharpie because I never know when I'm going to need to write on the front of a student's notebook their actual name or the back of their notebook or whatnot. Um, I'm trying to I have these little tabs that I put to section off my units. These are my saving grace. And whiteout. Whiteout is another saving grace because it helps me when I make that accidental mistake or I spell something incorrectly. I want to model to my students that accidents happen, but I also want to model to them that they need to put their effort into their notebook. You can see in this notebook right here, you know, we worked hard. You can actually see. See some of my planning up at the top that was below it. We worked hard to make sure everything fit in, and we have all of our components there, but we also added color. So it doesn't matter if you're using white paper and adding color, or you're using colorful paper and adding color like we did. Adding color is what helps it students make it their own, but involving them as well. This one involved my students. They got to build a graph based on their question that they asked. Again, involving my students. But when students make it their own, that goes beyond just color and making it the cover page. Let me show you some examples. Oops.
Okay, so here are some examples of how to help your students make the notebook their own. One, they let them decorate their cover pages. Right here you can see uh, we decorated unit one and I made a big number one and I wrote some terms in there that went along with what was being learned. Um, I wrote the title of the unit down below. All of that right there helped make that unit my own because I was taking the time to go through and focus on what was going to be taught. Now I will tell you, when my students saw this done ahead of time, they started to mimic that. They're like, ooh, Miss S has got a big number one. I'm gonna draw that too. Ooh, I like her zigzags. This is before they were officially being called a chevron, I think. Um, my students started writing down some of those numbers. I'm fine with that, but I don't enforce that. I don't enforce that theirs must be the same because I want them to make it their own. And that's when I started actually uh, just blowing up a number uh, of a font, making it the biggest it can be on one sheet of paper and copying it for the students. Uh, that way they each had the same shape, but they could color it and create it any way they wished. Now, a lot of that coloring had to be done outside of the classroom. So I wasn't wasting class time for that. Now, another one is, let them do projects in their notebook. This right here was a mini book that we did a decimal project. They were given a budget. Each student had a different budget. Each student had a different number of attendees and they had to create a party based on that budget and number of attendees. Now it was everything from I think five attendees and $100 up to 100 attendees and $10,000. It had had every form and fashion of some, some decent numbers. Now those that, they absolutely loved this activity because they could pretend it was their birthday party and what they would do. And they went all out. You know, I had one student in one class period who was actually lucky enough to get the five attendees and $10,000, so they got to have a pretty nice party. Suki, it's okay. Right here, you can see that my students are working on a work mat in their notebook. I gave them a shrunk down copy of the work mat. They have a envelope right here to hold their counters when they're done. These counters are simply one inch circles punched out of red and yellow paper. Instead of pulling out the manipulatives that day, I gave them counters that they could use over and over and over again. And the reason I did that is so that when they were at home and they were working on their homework, they could do the same thing because we had done it in class. And this allowed not only a visual and a manipulative item in class, but it allowed them to do it at home. It allowed them for one-on-one -on -one recognition with what they were doing. And you can see that student actually has his homework next to him. Um, so I, he might have gotten to start working on his homework early that day. And the picture at the top, you can see the students are, you, the pink paper uh, in the notebooks was their lesson that day. And part of their lesson involved an interactive component to where they had to scale a figure. So they were creating a new figure based on the problem. So they were actually, I was modeling to them how to use their notebooks as a resource. And when my students started seeing that and how to use it as a resource, I had to teach them. They don't know it when they're coming in unless they've had interactive notebooks before and they've been taught that. But you have to model as a teacher over and over and over again, no matter what grade you're at. And when they saw that connection, um, it started, building some further connections for them to be able to understand what was being taught and understand how their notebooks were beneficial. A question just came in that says, do I allow my students to take their notebooks home? If so, what happens when they forget it at home? Yes, my students took their notebooks home. Reason being, I didn't want to have to keep up with it in class. I did that the first few years and I dealt with everything from 
Miss S, my notebook's written in, or Miss S, my notebook's missing. I dealt with all of that drama, and high school, our middle schoolers are full of enough drama as it is that it just wasn't something I needed to manage that as well. Um, with 120 kids, it was just crazy. I know some teachers do it both ways. Uh, <coughs> sorry about that. You really need to determine what's best for you. Now, as a teacher, I also had a classroom blog where I put pictures of everything I did in class on the blog. So every notebook page was available for parents to see, for other uh, teachers in the school building to see, or my special ed teachers, all of that. So that helps. Now, if a student forgot it at home, this is actually something I recently wrote about, I think, on my blog. Um, I had them go grab two sheets of notebook paper, turn it to where the holes met. So that was their notebook paper for the day. So that was their notebook for the day. And I actually had to do this. Sorry, Sookie, let me put you down real quick. Because one day in class, I forgot my notebook. And I could not, as a teacher, not follow through with what I had said. So you can see right here, I've got three classes worth of material layered on top of each other. And I just had my students simply glue it in. So they would uh, glue down the page that they were working on, just like they worked on in class. So that way, they're not missing out on anything. They can't use that as an excuse. I wanted to go ahead and hit some other examples of output that I've done with my students, because I've got some examples in here. Um, my assistant Meg is in with us as well, and she's the one that's feeding me the questions. So if you have questions, please go ahead and write them. Some of a lot that I do when I talk about students creating word problems. That's always a follow-up activity. So I'm trying to find one of those so I can show that to you. There's another journal prompt. Very simple prompt, but they were given to be able to find it out, uh, to figure it out. So journal prompts can be open-ended. Oh, this is one of my favorite ones. Um, students were given for, the objective was finding the area of triangles, quadrilaterals, and polygons by composing into rectangles or decomposing into triangles and other shapes. So this one right here, they drew a card that said their composite shape needed to have one triangle, one square, and one rectangle. So they needed to draw that first. Once they drew that, then they needed to determine the area of the entire composite shape. So they had to break it down into pieces. They had to measure it, find the area of each figure, find the total area, and then there was a journal question. So again, getting students to reflect on what they have learned. Okay, here's one. So solving for area. So right here, you can see that it's a pocket with some index cards that say area and word problems. This was something I did a lot in my class because my students loved it. They were able to create their own word problems. Now, this took time and patience for me as a teacher. First day in the year, we started with one create. We, uh, uh, one problem, 
but we were able to build up to two or three in a class. Students would create their problems, they would swap with a partner, the partner would solve it, and then give it back to the original person. Then for homework, the original person would check what the partner wrote, or if we had time in class, either way, and then they would either pay or share the next day or that day. And they were able to work together and communicate. Communicating is a really big standard in math, but also in language arts and even in social studies. New question came in, says if you teach more than one class of the same subject, do you keep a notebook for each class? No. What I did was post-it notes became my friend, and I allowed one student to be Vanna for the day. And Vanna would sit underneath my, uh, or up by my uh, document camera. There's one in here, that's why I know. And Vanna would remove the post-it notes to reveal the next thing. I would put post-it notes over all my blanks. I would cut them down or I'd use the little ones or the set or whatnot. And that would cover the areas that I didn't want students to see from the very beginning. Now, I started the year to where my um, students who needed that little bit of extra thumb on them during class, they were the ones that first got to be Vanna because I knew if they were up there and they were following along and listening to me say, okay, I'm ready for the next one or okay, flip the next post-it or this, that or whatnot, they were paying attention. And they were also having to keep up with their notebook at the same time. So it was keeping them out of trouble by being at their desk where other people were around them, but it was also keeping them on track in class as well. Does that make sense, Tracy? There are times where I would do the activities on the smart board where I would project the blank page that we were doing and I would just write in answers in certain places or you know, I'd fold back something and I'd pretend like I was writing it in my flippable. That way I was writing it for every class and working with them at the same time, but I would either have it already written in my notebook, in my flippable, or I would write it at a later time. This, you know, just by changing those little things up every time, it allowed my students to stay with me and stay working. Uh, also, by having Vanna at my document camera, it allowed me to keep walking around the classroom and observing my students and making sure that they were doing their work as well as staying on task and getting things complete. As teachers, you know, we're just as much the facilitator as anything. I mean, crowd control is one of our main job descriptions. And that right there, just by walking around in the classroom, I was getting my steps in every day for sure. That made my students on the, um, on the, their game for the day. So, let me go ahead let me see. okay the last slide that you have in here is your certificate of attendance um, if you can turn that in for your hour of credit please do so I want you to get credit right now I'm going to open it up are there any other questions I want to make sure that I answer all of your questions before I get off tonight I do want to let you know that next Tuesday night is the elementary workshop. We're going to talk all about elementary ideas and how we can uh, use interactive notebooks in our elementary classroom. Okay, I'm just making sure I've marked the questions red. Um, Meg did make a point for using different colors for different things also helped her to memorize the material. Meg is also an education uh, major. She, she's not in education anymore, but she was an education major and graduated with that degree. And um, so yes, color means a lot for kids. For 
one thing when I was last teaching in the classroom, math was green in seventh grade. So every seventh grader, if they had a green notebook, you knew that was their math notebook. Uh, every different subject had a different color notebook and folder. So I had a green notebook and a green folder for math class. And so that helped them stay organized. Let me see if I can hit some of the other questions, maybe. Um, Oh, also, if you are looking, yes, you will receive an email reminder next week as well um, if you are on that list. You are very welcome, Tracy. Oh, no, Monica. I I'm glad you got in, though. And it's recorded, so you can always come back and watch this. You can share it with your friends. As soon as it hits YouTube, you can make sure to share it with your friends and all that stuff. Um, also on the interactivitiesforall.com uh, site, there is a resources page. So if you are looking for pre-planned interactive notebooks for different subjects and grade levels, yes, beyond just math, I have compiled with some of my friends. And I have linked up to their resources on that page. So if you are interested in finding things for other subjects, please feel free to check those out as well. And just one last little uh, thing before we go ahead and close off for tonight. Um, my store, for all of you lovely people who are out there tonight and tomorrow, is on sale 15% off. So through October 10th, 2014, if you are viewing this video today or tomorrow, you can save an extra 15% off at shopformulafun.com. I hope you have a fabulous night and feel free to email me at any time, formulafun at gmail.com. And I'll see you next time.